Hello and welcome to On Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mowry of Dre Renee Knits and this is where we talk about things that we like to make. It's a little Q&A, you ask questions, I try to answer them. My chair is rolling away. <laughs> um, everything, primarily knitting, but sometimes we dabble in a little bit of spinning or sewing and I actually just took my first ever weaving classes last week and holy smokes it was fantastic i am just gonna do one of these for all the weavers out there because wow i mean just so much to learn and in like the best way um i took a class at harrisville designs with tom gibson and gibson, and it was so fantastic. I learned so much. I cannot remember the last time I learned that much in one week. And we were on a floor loom. Um, so big looms and maybe if I remember by the end of this, I'll show you some of my samples. I, I am, I'm hoping to share my newsletter soon. Just some of the things I learned. Um, don't worry, non-weavers, this will not become all weave if I want to. Uh, we were actually joking. I took the class with my buddy and they're like, how long is your podcast name going to get? I don't really have time in my life for another craft, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try my best to fit it in because it was really, really neat. I really loved it. So I highly recommend if you have the opportunity to learn some weaving, uh, to give it a go. And if you're already a weaver, I would just, I'd love to hear, why do you love to weave? What do you love to weave? Do you have any books you love? I always love getting books. Um, so, okay, let's, let's talk about Sorry, I did not get a lot of sleep last night and it is second coffee of the daytime. So I'm, I am gonna be sipping on this a bit through today's show. I hope that maybe you have a warm beverage as you are joining me as well, or maybe a cold one because it's steamy out there today. But da, 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 this year's Rhinebeck sweater just released yesterday. So this is Alpen Glow which was named during our naming contest by Jackie. And if you do a quick internet search for Alpenglow, it will bring up all these images. And it's so perfect for this sweater. She did such a great job. So thank you, Jackie. And yeah, this was released today. This is my fifth annual collaboration with Magpie Fibers and Spin Cycle Yarns. We kind of fell into this tradition uh, five years ago when they both were releasing a new yarn and I had talked to both of them about using the yarns and I was like, what if we used them together? And the timing just happened to work out perfectly that we were going to rhyme back together that fall. And so we're like, what if we did a knit along? And it all just kind of fell into place. And it's just been so much fun and the best ever experience with all the amazing knitters that join in and knit the sweater and then we meet up on the hill at Rhinebeck and we take a bigger photo and we all talk about like oh what yarn did you use what yarn did you use did you do some modification wow your gauge is so nice you know i love to knit that kind of that kind of experience um so it's just really really wonderful if you are sitting here going what in the world is Rhinebeck <laughs> <laughs> um so every year in October there is New York Sheep and Wool which is a outdoor mostly outdoor fiber festival and it's in upstate New York in a little town called Rhinebeck and it's just magical the leaves are always changing color and there's apple cider donuts which sadly I can't have can we please get a gluten-free donut maker at Rhinebeck somebody start doing that <laughs> Um, but it's just a really special magical place. A lot of people travel from all over to go and I look forward to it every single year. And I look forward to this pattern release and just to connecting with lots of knitters through the knit along every year. So it just went live yesterday. We are doing a knit along hosted by the amazing Sam and Kayla. If you have done this with us before, then you probably already know Sam and Kayla. They are the managers at Magpie and they do such a beautiful job with the netalog. They do live streams on Instagram and they're just fantastic. So they actually already did a live stream yesterday. So if you're on Instagram, they did a really great one about yarn, what yarn to use, um, lots of different color bundle ideas. 
and it was really fantastic. So I do recommend watching that if you're on Instagram. Um, it's the Magpie Fibers. Can I say Instagram one more time? <laughs> Instagram account. And they save all their lives. So you can go find it even if you didn't get to watch it yesterday. So anything else? Oh, okay. I was going to mention this at the end, but I am too afraid that I will forget. One more sip of coffee. My birthday's coming up in just a couple days. And that means my annual birthday sale is coming. So if you are not already subscribed, you definitely want to subscribe to my newsletter so you can be amongst the first to know when that sale kicks off. Um, as I said, it's in a couple days and I'll put that link down below. Also, if you are a newsletter subscriber and you have not checked your inbox since yesterday, since this pattern got released, make sure to go check it out because your special discount for this sweater is in there and it expires tonight at midnight. So October 29th at midnight EST, Eastern Standard Time. Um... And this is the only pattern of my independently published patterns that won't be included in the sale because I just released it. Um, but all my other patterns will be included. So let's get to some questions. All right. Should you block a sweater before picking up stitches for things like button bands or necklines? Um, so basically, to put this very succinctly, if you want it to lay flatter to make it easier to pick up those stitches, yes. Do you have to? No. Um, not unless the pattern gave you other, some other specific reason as to why you might want to do that. It's For me, it's basically just because it really helps that edge. You know, a stockinette fabric and some other knit fabrics, they're going to want to roll. And so before they're blocked, it can just be, you're kind of like working against it to pick up those stitches evenly. And you definitely wanna make sure if you don't block it before picking up stitches, that you pay attention so that you don't actually jump over half a row uh, because that's when you will notice that. You want it to be, um, you want that pick up row to be alongside like a nice neat column of a full like knit stitch, if that makes sense. Um, the only time where I might not is for a neckline. If I'm doing so, for instance, Elp and Glow, is you actually cast on the yoke and knit the whole sweater and then you do sorry and then you do the collar at the end and the reason I did that is because I love a doubled um I just got like a low battery warning on my phone <laughs> it's been better for these days so I have had to use my phone a lot so I'm like don't get too chatty, Andrea. Anyways, um, so I love a doubled over collar like this, a hemmed collar. And I find that with the weight of a hemmed collar over time, if you work this from the top down, sometimes it can stretch out a little bit. The nice thing about that is it can be a pretty easy fix. A lot of people will just take a little bit of elastic thread and weave it through that collar and that'll help kind of pull it back in. So if you do have any loosey-goosey collars at home that are doubled like this that you want to tighten up, that's a great option as a way to do that. Just buy some elastic thread and thread it through to get it back, give, give it some new life. But another workaround for that, and you could apply this to any pattern, um, is by doing the collar separately. So I knit the whole sweater and then I went back and I picked up stitches and that cast on, having that full on cast on there that I picked up stitches into, it just reinforces it and gives it a stronger foundation so that that collar doesn't start to like overstretch too much. Um, so for those of you who have emailed me saying, hey, I don't like when the collar of my sweater gets too wide, um, that would be kind of a good option for you is to knit the body of the sweater and then go back and do the collar afterward. Or even if it's a bottom up sweater, bind off and then pick up into that bind off, bound off edge and it just gives it more stability. All right, okay. I'm sure you're getting a million and one questions about the beautiful Alpen Glow, but I'm going to ask another one anyway. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of mohair. I know, unpopular opinion. Not necessarily. I don't think you're alone. Um, and I saw on Spin Cycles post someone who made it without mohair. My question is, do you then need to substitute a fingering weight yarn for that? Or can you just continue with the sport weight? Thanks for your help. So, 
the nice thing about this, so I actually used plume. I have some right here. Look at that. I actually have something right next to me that I talk about. It's rare here. Um, so this is plume. This is what I used. And this is actually a cashmere base from Magpie Fibers. It's their newest yarn. They released it this spring and it has a silk core. So it's not, it doesn't have as much of a halo as mohair does. And I would say it's softer. Um, like definitely no, like mohair for some people can be a little bit pokey, even though it's so soft and it does that really gorgeous halo, but it's not for everybody. This is like a more subtle, um, feeling than that. And so that is what I used. Mohair is a great substitute for this, really anything fluffy, uh, if you want the texture, but if you're like, I don't want the texture, that's totally fine. I would just continue with sport weight and you're not going to have any issues. Um, so for instance, I think the post you saw, they used more of the dyed in the wool for that chevron and it did look really, really beautiful. Um, you could also pick another color of dyed in the skein. You could do a fun little color pop if you've got a mini skein sitting around. Um, so you could definitely just sub in a sport weight. Um, in the pattern, I hold that cashmere double, which equals about a fingering weight or even a light fingering weight. The thing about that is that fluff really blooms. And so that's how it can work up to be pretty even with the gauge that's happening on either side of it. But I think a sport weight would be great. That was a long answer for a simple question. <laughs> um, okay, next question. I'm, I'm just going to keep on sipping my coffee. I hope y'all don't mind. If you're curious about this beautiful, beautiful mug, it's one of my favorites. This is from Ohm Ceramics. And I love it. I love the speckled, the speckled look. As you all probably know, I really like a speckled. All right. Did I go through? Oh, no. Okay. No, did I turn my head? No, no, no. I'm good. All of a sudden, I started to doubt myself. No, we are. We are okay. <laughs> my question is how to estimate how much can blocking fix the garment to the right size? For example, I'm knitting the night shift shawl. The beginning of the shawl is curled to one side, probably because I knitted my eye cord too tightly, my eye cord edge. So I really don't want to frog it and have been hoping blocking the garment afterwards will fix the curling. Is there a way to know whether or not the shawl can be fixed by wet blocking with pins? I can't send a picture, but the tip of the shawl looks like this or this. Uh, my favorite part and maybe one of the reasons why I had to pick this question is because they used emojis to describe how it was curling and they're so perfect. One looks like a cresting wave and the other looks like a tornado and that, I don't know, it just made me happy. Gave me a giggle. Um, so it's, that shawl does curl on the edge, especially pre-blocking. So there is a good chance blocking is going to help it. You do have to be careful with those I-cord edges. They can create such a nice flexible edge if they're knit loosely enough, but they're really tempting to knit tightly. It's tempting to give that yarn a tug. Um, so to ask your, like the very foundation of your question here, which was how to estimate how much blocking can fix the garment. Um, basically you don't know unless you try and that's what'll give you your answer. So what I recommend doing is throwing that shawl onto some waste yarn or if you have the barber's cords, um, and blocking it where it is right now and making sure that you can straighten that out at least enough to where you'll be happy with it. Um, and with that shawl, I will say it can handle a pretty hard blocking. Like you can kind of tug on it into the shape you like. Um, and I didn't find to have any issues with that. So you could definitely kind of tug it to try and straighten out that edge and put in some pins and let it dry. It might still curl up a little bit after drying, like as you wear it, but also keep in consideration, like as you're wearing it, you're probably not going to really notice that. Like it doesn't become as big of a deal. Um, so that is what I would do. I would try blocking it and see what happens. And that way, you know, like, oh no, this is really bothering me. The eye cord's too tight and I want to loosen it up. Because the other thing I will mention, if the eye cord is too tight, it might affect the finished size of the shawl. So it might be a little on the small side. Um, and sometimes a tight eye cord doesn't feel great, like around your neck, like when you're wearing it. So just some things to consider. I would definitely block it, 
give it a little tug test and see how you feel about it. All right, one more question, one more sip. We actually have two more questions. I'm knitting the Velocore and really enjoying it. Y'all, I picked some doozies of questions. You guys asked such great questions this week and all of them were, as I was picking them, I was like, I'm not really sure I'm gonna answer this. Do I know the answer? I don't know, but we're gonna try our best. So I digress, let's continue. I'm knitting the Velocore and really enjoying it. I separated front and back for the sleeves and as I was ready to bind off the stitches for the neckband in the front, I noticed I had an extra 10 stitches. Yes off by 10 stitches for the whole sweater. The back piece has the right amount of stitches. Any idea on how I can easily fix this? I was thinking to decrease one stitch each side every second row at the neckband. I'm open to other suggestions. I don't feel like starting over, but I'm afraid it might be the only way. So, yeah, because 10 stitches isn't a ton. So Velcor, I was just wearing in our previous video. Was it in the last video or the one before it? I, I wore it really recently. So if you just peek through my recent videos, you'll see me wearing it with overalls. And I love that sweater so much, especially because it's really like, I can wear it spring, summer, and fall pretty solidly. So it gets a lot of wear. It's my warm weather sweater. And, but it is, it's quite a few stitches and the yarn is a fairly thin yarn. Um, so it's a little bit of a labor of love. I, you definitely do not need to start over. I don't think you have any plans to start over anyways. It's just 10 stitches. But 10 stitches isn't really enough. Like if it was more, I would, oh yeah, then it would be really. Then you could almost like bind off, do like the center neck bind off and then bind off a few more at the edges to kind of almost give it more of like a scoop neck. And I say that very loosely. It's not going to get that goopy. It's still going to be a pretty boat neck. Um, but, oh, you did say, I don't feel like starting over, but I'm afraid it might be the only way. Do not start over. It's going to be fine. So I think what I would do personally is I'm not sure where you're at in like how close you are to the actual shoulder bind off. Um, cause you said you were getting ready to bind off the stitches for the neck band in the front. So, hmm. <laughs> here's what I would do. I would bind off an extra two stitches for the neck. One and two. Sorry, I'm in my head, I'm going through how I did that neck. Do you do the neck first? I should have reviewed this pattern now that I'm thinking about how, because I have a memory of having to go around the whole neck, because you do, do you knit like a little collar on it? <laughs> okay, so one thing you could do is you could just bind off the shoulders as is, and then when you go to knit that little bit of a collar, which I think you do, okay, I might be wrong, but if you do have to knit a little bit of a collar, you could just evenly space out some decrease, 10 decreases is kind of a lot though, for the neck. So, sorry, I, I should have, this is a question I should have thought about first, but bear with me here as I process this. I think what I would do is potentially, I would kind of break up these stitches. So I would get rid of four on each shoulder. And I would just do that during the bind off. I would kind of evenly space them out as you do that three needle bind off. And I would bind off an extra stitch four times, kind of spacing them out on each side. And that's going to leave you with just two stitches in the neck to deal with. And that's really easy to just eat those up, you know, just decrease them out um, as you work the neck or before. If there's a collar, you could do it as you go around. You could even split it up like three, three and four right there. And that wouldn't be a big deal. Um, so that's what I would do. I would just fudge it and I would just sneak those stitches away, um, during like the bind off or the knitting of the neck collar. Originally, I was going to say, depending on where you are with those shoulders, you could potentially, um, like decrease out a couple stitches right before you do the bind off is another option. But I also think you could just bind off like two for one in that three needle bind off. So you're using two stitches from the front to one stitch in the back and just kind of space those out 
So I think three, three, and four might be kind of nice to spread that out. So give that a go. That's, that's what I would maybe do. I hope that made sense and I hope it helps. Let us know how it goes. All right, last question. One more sip of coffee. A few weeks ago, I started a birch pullover. After a little oops in the yoke, I put in a lifeline and a while later, another. I've separated for the sleeves and knit a bit and took out the lifelines. I noticed two very obvious lines where the lifeline was. I tried spraying it, steaming, and wet blocking, but nothing worked to get the lines out. Any other ideas, tips, or tricks? So what I'm curious about is how thick the yarn was that you, or the thread that you used for your lifeline because that sweater does use a fingering to light fingering weight. So if you use anything thicker than that, trying to knit around that would make sense to why those stitches got a little bit stretched out, which is what it sounds like to me. It sounds like those stitches are just a little bit elongated. Unfortunately, I'm not sure what you could do after the fact if wet blocking didn't help. I think if you gave it a good soak, so when you wet blocked, how long did you soak it for? I personally would soak it for probably like at least 15 minutes. And then I would kind of zhuzh it around after I got it out of the bath to kind of try to work some of the tension um, around those stitches to kind of hide that elongation that happened on each of those rows. So that's what I would do. I would kind of fiddle with it a little bit more. Make sure you soaked it enough for that yarn to really poof up when it to bloom after blocking and see if that helps. Unfortunately, outside of that, I can't really think of any fixes. Um, and then if it's helpful at all, and you may have already done this, but tips for the future would be um, make sure that whatever thread or string or yarn you're using for your lifeline is thinner than the yarn you're using for your project. I love to use embroidery floss because you can either use it at the thickness it is or you can strip it down into plies so that it's thinner. So a lot of embroidery floss is like six plies, six different threads twisted together. So you can even just pull off one of those and have that be your lifeline. Um, and then that's not going to accidentally stretch out those stitches. Also, you generally, for me, I only ever use one lifeline at a time. Once I'm to like, okay, this whole section's looking good. Um, I'll work a little further and then I'll just move my life line down to the next section. Or once I placed one, I know that one's in how I want it to be, then I would remove the one above it. Um, but yeah, geez, I'm sorry. I haven't run into that one a lot, so I'll be curious to hear how it goes. So please feel free to jump back into the comments and let us know if you figured out a fix for it. Um, and that's it. That was question five. I have a little show and tell for y'all before uh, my phone dies. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it doesn't. If this cuts off short, you know, I'm going to say goodbye now. And thank you so much for joining me. I hope to see you next week. But okay, for real, we still have some show and tell and hopefully my phone doesn't die. I just love coffee coffee and tea and all the warm beverages. Am I the only one that's already kind of thinking about fall? <laughs> we just hit like the hottest part of our summer here in Maine. It always happens pretty close to my birthday where it just gets a little steamy for my liking. And as I'm up in my studio wearing a sweater, I just, I'm already looking forward to fall and sweater season. I just, and, and hand knit sock season. Okay, I'm, not, I'm gonna miss the show and tell if I don't get going here, Andrea. All right, let me show this one last actually. So as you all know, I've been in a dilemma over, we're doing the Spin It to Knit It Weekender Edition. And during Tour de Fleece, which I did not end up doing nearly as much spinning as I had hoped, with that weaving class, that just zapped me. When we were done in the evenings, they were all day classes. So when we were done in the evenings, I just knew I could only do so many crafts and I needed to knit for work. So I didn't get to spin quite as much as I would have liked. But here are my two skeins that originally I was hoping to use for my weekender. I have since decided that I don't know if I want that much contrast. Although now that I'm holding them up, they're so pretty. I don't know. I was thinking now to use them for color work. It's a decent amount of yarn. It's like eight ounces. Um, because I use two four ounce braids. Tell me what you think. 
Do you think it's too contrasty for a weekender? I love the colors so much. I think I probably want to use it for color work. Even some brioche. It looks so good as brioche. Um, I was also a little worried that I spun my first skein a bit thinner than my second and they're not horribly different but one I would say is closer to a sport weight and the other one's pushing a DK in some spots so they're not perfectly even um but I love them and time will tell what I do with them no I'm not 100% sure <laughs> And then I had shown y'all for like a few weeks in a row there, I was doing a long spinning project. So this giant skein is probably with what I have left on my bobbins after plying, I would say it's probably about 10 ounces. I haven't weighed it again yet, uh, but I'm going to say about 10 or 11 ounces. And this was that multi um, combo spin I was doing that was a bat from Artifacts of Appreciation, who I have mentioned on here many times because her bats are just so pretty. And then, so that's one ply in here. And that bat had like some sorry silk in it. And so there's some like little tweety color bits that are really fun to come across. There's one right here, actually. Can you see it right there? Um, and then it was two colorways from Hello Yarn, Hello Fiber. Um, I think it was just the club colorways. And one I separated vertically way more times than I usually would. And then the other one, I think I just separated it into like two. Um, so one, it changes color faster than the other one. Um, and anyways, this is the finished yarn and I am so tickled. I love it. And see something like this could be really beautiful for the weekender, but this is all I've got. I had, I don't, I can't make more of this one. That's the thing with spinning with yarn when it comes to using like my precious yarn most of it I'm like I can always buy more and that's how I get myself to use the precious things but with your hand spun okay this it's I'm really tempting fate with my phone about to die but with my hand spun um you only have so much so that little low battery thing made me lose my train of thought was there anything else yeah, so I don't know. How are you doing with the weekend or spin along? I kind of have to go back to the drawing board. Um, I think I'm in that like afraid to make the wrong decision point of the process, which I go through with like every crafting process. So um, yeah, that's I'm still working on it and I'll let you know how it goes. But thank you so much for joining me this week. I hope to see you back here next week. You get two farewells because my phone hasn't died yet. Um, but I really appreciate it. And thank you for asking questions. And I can't wait to answer some more of them next week. I hope you have a great weekend. I hope you get to make something. And happy knitting. Bye.